Welcome to Central Baptist Church of Livingston, Texas. We're glad that you've chosen to study God's Word with us today. We'd invite you to visit our website, centrallivingston.com, to learn more about our mission to preach, to teach, and to live the gospel for the glory of God. Now, open your Bible or your Bible app and study God's Word with us. Second Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, the word of the Lord reads, And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul, that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul, whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is a crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the the son of Amiel at Lodabar, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said to Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson, and you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a son, young son, whose name was Micah, and all who lived in Ziba's house Came, became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated as we join together in prayer. Father, you are without limits. Before creation, you were. And before the concept of time, you were. And you have no end. Lord, being infinite in your power, nothing is capable of stopping you, and you can accomplish whatever you wish. Lord, there is nothing that is outside your knowledge, and God, we are humbled by your infinite character, and we realize that in all your ways, you are measureless and without end. You are the great God that we serve, and there is no one like you, and nothing compares to who you are. But as we are reminded of your infinite and measureless ways, it reminds us of who we are. We are a frail and sinful people who constantly stray from your commandments. Lord, forgive us where we have sinned against you. We are in desperate need of you. Lord, we thank you for being our faithful God to your people in times of trouble. When things are not going our way, We can bow our head and go to you in prayer. When times are not what we expect them to be and our plans go awry, we can look to the one who still is in control and is still sitting on his throne. And thank you, God, for being faithful and true. But Lord, we ask if it is within your will, Lord, that you would bring this pandemic to an end and that you would heal those who have been sick or afflicted during this time. Lord, we pray for our nation, that you would heal this disunity, that we would be able to have understanding and grace towards one another, 
We pray today for Polk County and our county commissioner, Robert Willis. Give him wisdom to make decisions that would honor you. Lord, we ask that you would be with Blanchard Baptist Church and their pastor, Fred Alford. Help them to be a light for you and their community and that their love and zeal for you could not be hid. God, be with our church today. Help us to listen, to make the changes in our lives that you are willing, that you are calling us to. Be with Pastor Sam Webb as he brings to us your word. Give him the strength he needs to preach your truth. Lord, we also pray that you would be with our pastor search committee nomination process, that you would have your will and your way in that process, and that you would be honored and glorified in everything that is done there. All these things we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ at University Park Baptist Church in Houston, Texas. Uh, it is a joy to be back with you this morning to consider God's Word. Last time I was here a few weeks ago, uh, we considered one sentence from 1 Timothy 1.15, and it's not lost on me the irony that we're going to consider an entire chapter from 2 Samuel chapter 9 this morning. Uh, I like to play in contrasts, so hang with me. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, we considered last time the saying that is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And you may recall from that sermon that one of the points that we considered was that Jesus Christ came as our king, that he came as our king to reign and to rule over God's people. He came as our king to sit upon the throne of his father, David. So this morning, I want us to spend some more time considering Jesus Christ, our king. And to do that, I want us to take a look at a rather obscure chapter in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 9, found on page 169 and 170 of the Pew Bibles. And it's my aim this morning to illustrate for you from this rather obscure chapter, Lord willing, the covenant grace of King Jesus that is available to all of his people. It's our aim this morning to consider the covenant grace of King Jesus through the story of King David and Mephibosheth. As a side note, uh, I want to just say to Paul, well done with all the names, wherever Paul's at, uh, well done with all the names in that chapter. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart to read through the entire chapter and pronounce Mephibosheth 16 times, uh, but I'm going to do it in this sermon, so pray for me in that. And if I do mess up, you're, feel free to laugh. It's perfectly fine. My wife and kids do it all the time. If you're taking notes this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 9, you're taking notes, there will be two main sections of the sermon. Two main sections of the sermon. The first section will spend briefly overviewing the covenants in the Bible so that we can understand how God's covenantal relationship works throughout the Bible with his people. And that section will be called covenant, covenant Grace Explained. Covenant Grace Explained. Secondly, we'll consider a section in the sermon called Covenant Grace Examined. Covenant grace examined. And here we will spend the vast majority of our time as we examine King David's relationship to Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 9 as a microcosm to teach us how King Jesus relates to his people in the church. So those are the two main sections of the sermon. Those are the two main sections if you're taking notes. Covenant grace explained and covenant grace examined. Covenant grace explained and covenant grace examined examined. Let's take a moment now and go to God and ask him to be with us and bless this time as we consider his word. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we pray that you would teach us this morning that your covenant grace precedes, accompanies, and follows out of our salvation, that it sustains the redeemed soul, and that not one link of its chain can ever be broken. That your faithfulness is great, O God. And that you hold us fast through covenant grace 
For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen and amen. Well, what do you think when you hear the word covenant? What do you think when you hear the word covenant? Perhaps you think it's just an old word for a contract, and you wouldn't be wrong about that. You know, in the civil law here in the state of Texas, we have all kinds of covenants. Covenants not to compete. Covenants that apply to the land. And maybe you think of covenants or a covenant as a promise. So you might think in this context of a marriage covenant, the promise between one man and one woman to have and to hold for better or worse, through sickness and in health, for richer or poor, to love and to cherish till death they do part. And my guess is that this is the most common thing you think of when you hear the word covenant. Well, the idea of covenant is fundamental to the Bible. It's fundamental to the Bible. One author said at its most basic that covenant, the idea of covenant, presents God's desire to enter into relationship with men and women created in his own image. So a good definition of covenant would be an unchangeable, divinely imposed agreement between God and man that stipulates the conditions of that relationship. A divinely imposed agreement between God and man that stipulates the relationship between God and man. So we see in the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, that God makes a covenant to bless Adam and Eve if they obey God and not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. After our first parents disobeyed God, ate the forbidden fruit, and so broke covenant with God, God graciously promised in Genesis chapter 3, 15 to redeem the covenant, to establish a means by which now sinful humanity might fellowship and be in relationship with God. So to accomplish this redemption, God promised in Genesis 3, 15 to send a male child who would perfectly fulfill the terms of the first covenant. And so the rest of the Bible after Genesis 3, including our text this morning, 2 Samuel 9, the rest of the Bible is the outworking of God bringing this covenant promise to fulfillment. And so as the history of redemption unfolds, God made covenant with Noah in Genesis 8 and 9 to never again destroy the earth by a flood. In Genesis 12 through 17, God made covenant with Abraham to make him a great nation with many descendants, so that through the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Then after the exodus from Egypt, God made a covenant with Moses and the people of Israel to make the Israelites his treasured possession, his kingdom of priests, his holy nation. And as part of that covenant, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, as the foundational requirements of the covenant between God and Israel. And so it was that the prophets of old would prosecute God's people of old for breaking covenant, for breaking those commandments with God, for not living in accord with God's commands. But even as the prophets of old prosecuted God's people of old for breaking the covenant, the prophet Isaiah appealed to a different covenant, The prophet Isaiah appealed to the Davidic covenant set down for us in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel 7, as a means of hope, the prophet Isaiah appealed to this Davidic covenant. So in Isaiah 6, we read of the holy seed who would come from David that would remain faithful to the covenant. It was the holy seed that was promised to Abraham's descendant, to David himself, that shepherd boy from Bethlehem. And so David rose to power by slaying the Philistine giant Goliath, and he was anointed by the priestly prophet Samuel. And after King Saul died, David was anointed king over God's people Israel. And in 2 Samuel 7, that in, in 2 Samuel 7, God made a covenant with David, saying, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up after you from your offspring him who shall come from your body, in other words, your seed, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
God promised to David to raise up his seed and establish the throne of his kingdom forever. David was a covenant king. And through David would come the forever king, Jesus Christ. So it's no wonder then that when we open the New Testament, we read in the first sentence of the first book of the New Covenant document, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see, the progressive outworking of the covenants in the Bible find their fulfillment in the Davidic king, Jesus Christ himself, who came into the world to save sinners. Jesus Christ, who came into the world to establish a new covenant with God's people. So Christians are a new covenant people. And our relationship to God is on the basis of this new covenant set forth throughout the old covenants fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so for the Christian, the Old and the New Testament are God's covenant documents to us. Why am I telling you this? Why are we working through this right now? Well, the the reason is because when we come to a chapter like 2 Samuel chapter 9, 2 Samuel chapter 9 in the Old Testament, we read it in light of our covenant king, King Jesus, and we see in it the very covenant grace of our king, King Jesus Christ, the son of David. And so now let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, and examine the covenant grace of the king. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. I'm going to read this again, since it is a uh, my, my assumption is it's a rather obscure passage. So let me read chapter 9, verses 1 through 8 for us once again. David said, King David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And Ziba said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show him the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always." And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Well, here in the narrative of 2 Samuel, you may recall that the book recounts David's meteoric rise to the throne of Israel. The author tells us of that Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 8 is David recounting his military victories. And here in 2 Samuel 9, We have this peculiar chapter where the mighty King David stops from his military conquests and he exhibits covenant grace to Mephibosheth. There are a number of observations. In fact, there will be seven observations this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 9 about the covenant grace of the king in this story of David and Mephibosheth. First, we see that covenant grace remembers Covenant grace remembers. In verse 1, King David asks the question, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Well, in the midst of defeating Israel's enemies and establishing his rule as king, David stops and David remembers. He stops and he remembers a covenant made to Jonathan. King Saul's son. He stops and he remembers this covenant that is set forth for us in 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20, Jonathan is speaking to David, and we pick it up in verse 14. Jonathan says, If I am still alive, David, 
Show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from, your ha- from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of your enemies. And Jonathan made a covenant with David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by covenant, by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. King David here stops in 2 Samuel 9, and he remembers the covenant promise that he made to Jonathan, the son of an enemy. He doesn't stop and remember the evil deeds that the house of Saul had committed before the Lord. He doesn't stop and remember how the house of Saul wanted to kill him. No, King David stops, and he remembers the covenant promise made to Jonathan not to harm the descendants of the house of Saul. King David remembers his covenant promise to show his enemies covenant grace. So brothers and sisters in Christ, you need to know that your God remembers his covenant too. Your God remembers his covenant to promise his enemies covenant grace. Your evidence of that. Your evidence of that. When God promised to Eve to send a Savior so many years ago, God remembered his covenant promise when at just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because of this covenant grace, brothers and sisters, you are no longer an enemy, but a son. And if a son of God, then an heir through Jesus Christ. And this is a sure covenant because God cannot break a covenant It is in his very nature to remember his covenant promise, just as King David here remembers his covenant promise. So we can praise God, brothers and sisters in Christ, for the covenant grace that God has shown us in King Jesus. The second observation from 2 Samuel 9, covenant grace remembers, and secondly, covenant grace is kind. Covenant grace is kind. David not only remembers the covenant that he made with Jonathan, but he remembers the covenant in order to show the kindness of God. In order to show the kindness of God. See verse 3. Verse 3, the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Well, this kindness is not a sentimental kindness. It's not a hallmark greeting card kind of kindness. No, this is the kindness of Almighty God. In Hebrew, this is chesed, And chesed is the steadfast faithfulness and love of God. The steadfast faithfulness and love of God. It's a covenant kindness by which God himself has determined that he will act with faithfulness and love toward his people. And so King David says here in verse 3, I will act toward the descendants of the house of Saul with loving kindness because God himself has acted towards me with loving kindness. And praise God that he not only remembers his covenant, but praise God, brothers and sisters in Christ, that he acts in kindness to his covenant people. Can you imagine how awful it would be for a father to remember his duty of discipline towards his children, but to forget his loving kindness for them? Or what of a man who remembers his vow to his wife, but lives day to day despising her? and hating her. No, God is not like that father or that husband. King David here teaches us that God remembers his covenant grace. He teaches us that that God is as Moses recorded for us in Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast covenant love for generations. Oh, Christian, how kind has God been to you? How kind has God been to you? God has loved you when you were unlovable. He gave all for you when you had nothing to give in return. And so, brothers and sisters, this should motivate us to show the kindness of God to others. So let me encourage you to speak a kind word to an undeserving person this week. Be generous with your possessions towards those who owe you nothing. Exercise authority 
in such a way that those under your care will, will see your good and kind deeds and glorify your God who is in heaven. Do this, brothers and sisters, because God has been kind to you in Jesus Christ. Covenant grace remembers, covenant grace is kind, and notice too that King David's kindness to Mephibosheth, it was not arbitrary. It wasn't an arbitrary kindness. No, King David was kind to Mephibosheth for the sake of another. He was kind to Mephibosheth for the sake of another. And this is our third observation this morning. Covenant grace is predicated on another. Covenant grace is predicated on another. King David does not remember the covenant or does not remember the covenant with Jonathan and show kindness to Mephibosheth for Mephibosheth's sake. But quite the opposite. What does what does verse 1 say? That I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And verse 7, do not fear Mephibosheth, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. So in 1 Samuel 20, David came to Jonathan fearing for his life. David feared that Saul, uh, Jonathan's father, would kill him. And in 1 Samuel 20, before the, the covenant between Jonathan and David, Jonathan says to David, whatever you say, David, I will do for you. And so David asked Jonathan to deal kindly with him, to protect him from his father Saul. And Jonathan agreed and faithfully carried out this promise to David at the risk of his own life. And then later, Jonathan and David covenant together. It's this faithfulness and this covenant faithfulness that leads to David's faithfulness in 2 Samuel 9. It's because of Jonathan's faithfulness in 1 Samuel 20 that leads to King David's covenant kindness towards Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel 9. There is nothing that Mephibosheth has done to merit the kindness from King David. It is solely the work of his father, Jonathan, that Mephibosheth receives kindness from King David. And so, brothers and sisters, what we have here is a very picture of the gospel. The very picture of the gospel, covenant grace is given to the undeserving for the sake of another. And the bad news, the bad news about all of this is that we have all sinned against God. We have all broken covenant with God. This is a problem because God is holy and good and just. God cannot be in covenant relationship with a sinful people, with a sinner, without justly punishing the sin. So we're reminded that the writer of Hebrews says, Indeed, under the covenant, everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. In order to maintain the covenant with Israel, God had set forth a sacrificial system so that by the shedding of the blood of a spotless lamb, there might be forgiveness of sins and that God might show covenant grace to his people. And undeserving people received covenant grace from God because of the substitutionary sacrifice of another. Just like Mephibosheth received covenant grace from King David for the sake of another. And so we read again in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, of the sacrificial system under the old covenant. And we read that Jesus Christ himself has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old. As the covenant that he mediates is better than the old covenant. And so we learn that the Old Testament sacrificial system was but a shadow of a greater sacrifice and a better covenant. You see, brothers and sisters, this new covenant, this new covenant under Jesus Christ solves the riddle once and for all. How can a holy and a just God be in covenant relationship with a sinful and a wicked people? Well, Hebrews 9:26. But as it is, Jesus Christ has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Therefore, the scripture says. Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. This is the good news of Christianity. This is the good news that we see whispered here in the pages of 2 Samuel chapter 9. This is the work of Jesus Christ, King King David's son, on behalf of all of those who would give themselves to him by faith. The good news that grafts you in into the covenant grace of Almighty God. 
God's new covenant grace and kindness is sure, for he remembers the work of another. God remembers the work of his son, Jesus Christ on the cross, who died in the place of repenting sinners. And God remembers that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And God remembers that Jesus is even now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, actively obeying all of God's commands, interceding for his covenant people. And God remembers all of the work of Christ and the righteousness of Christ given to you, Christian. You have the righteousness of the covenant king. God remembers his covenant grace, and he loves you, brothers and sisters in Christ. God loves you, but not for your own sake, but for the sake of Jesus Christ. God loves you for Jesus' sake. My unbelieving friend, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you need to know that everyone is either in covenant fellowship with God Or you are like Mephibosheth, a covenant enemy of the king. Notice in our text that King David, he did not call for descendants from the Philistines or the Canaanites. Why not? Because King David defeated his enemies. He defeated his enemies. And friend, if you're here and you're not in covenant fellowship with God, this will be your end too when God finishes his enemies in hell. Instead, King David, well, he calls for Mephibosheth, a former enemy who found grace from the king, not because of anything Mephibosheth had done, but because of what Jonathan had done. Friend, so it is with you and God. So it is with you and God. We are all by nature Philistines and Canaanites, enemies of God, rebels against God's good authority over our lives. And so because God is good and God is just, he must and he will defeat his enemies. But the good news, the good news, friend, is that we can all be like Mephibosheth. God has made a way for us to be welcomed into covenant fellowship with him through the work of another, through the work of Jesus Christ, his perfect obedience, his sinless life, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. For Jesus' sake, God will forgive your sin and make covenant with you. So be like Mephibosheth this morning. Hear the voice of the king calling out for you and respond by turning from your sin and trusting not in yourself, but trust on another. Trust on Jesus Christ for salvation this morning. Covenant grace remembers. Covenant grace is kind. Covenant grace is for the sake of another. And we learn here in 2 Samuel chapter 9 that the covenant grace of God is sure, he remembers it, it's kind, it's predicated on another, and we learn that covenant grace is active. Covenant grace is active. It compels action from King David. In verse 2, King David sends for Ziba, the servant, and he asks, is there anyone in the house of Saul that David might carry out his covenant promise that he made to Jonathan? And Ziba responds that, yes, Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan. He lives in Lodabar in the house of Machir, verse 4. So in verse 5, covenant grace compels David to act, to send out for Mephibosheth. And so we can learn here that covenant grace is not passive. Notice that after remembering the covenant that he made with Jonathan, David doesn't wait around for Mephibosheth or sit idly by wondering if anyone from the house of Saul might stop in to receive kindness for Jonathan's sake. No, that is not what King David does. King David is compelled to act for Jonathan's sake. And isn't this true of God? Isn't this true of God? When Adam and Eve were naked and ashamed in the garden, God initiated reconciliation. When the whole earth was covered with evil, even then Noah found grace from God in the eyes of the Lord. And while Abram tended to his herd and cared for Sarai, God intervened and God called them out and gave them new names. When the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead his people to freedom 
and the people of Israel were in need of leadership. So God raised up judge after judge and then king after king. Throughout the Old Testament, God is the primary actor acting out of his covenant grace towards his people so that he might save them just as he has promised. God is the primary actor. God is the one who gives prophets and priests and kings. And so just the right time, God sent forth his son. Not because of anything that we had done to merit it, but because covenant grace compelled God to act for Jesus' sake. God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, or as Zane put it last week, the true savior, the true shepherd, the true sovereign, to be the final solution. The final solution to the enemies of God. God did this. God created. God called. God led. God guided. God disciplined. And God made provision for his people. He always has. And he finally has done it once and for all. The good news is that God is even still doing this. Even now, in this very moment, God sends forth his gospel message so that by the Spirit of Christ, you may have repentance and faith in Jesus' name. God remembers the new covenant, and he desires to show kindness to you for Jesus' sake. God is not sitting idly by, waiting for you to invite him in. No, like King David, God has made provision for you, and he commands you, he sends you to come, sends for you to come to him. And so in the words of that old Francis Thompson poem, God truly is the hound of heaven, seeking out repentance and faith for the good of his people and for the sake of Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, let me remind you this morning that you are God's means of activity in this new covenant age. God has given you his Holy Spirit. God has given you spiritual gifts that you might build up the church and glorify God. So brothers and sisters, we go and we make disciples of all nations and throughout all generations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, teaching them to obey all that he commands because our covenant God is actively building his church through you, Christian. So be about the work of God. Be about the active covenant grace of God in your life. But even more than covenant grace being active, covenant grace is effective. Covenant grace is effective. It's one thing that King David sends for Mephibosheth. It is another thing entirely that Mephibosheth actually comes. In verses 5 and 6 we read, King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David. And so this is the fifth observation. Covenant grace is effective. Covenant grace is effective. And it's effective in at least two ways. Covenant grace saves and covenant grace restores. Here we have a king who has made ruin of all his enemies. And he stands victorious even over the house of Saul. King David is strong and powerful and mighty. And we have here one remaining member of the house of Saul who has fled from Jerusalem and cannot even care for himself for he is crippled in both his feet. Mephibosheth is weak and frail and literally incapable of fulfilling the king's request to come to Jerusalem. In any other circumstance, the politically shrewd move for King David is to take him out. It's just to take him out. But the good news for Mephibosheth is that the king's decree, his covenant grace, is effective. It saves Mephibosheth. The king's word accomplishes the king's will. And so brothers and sisters, so it is with God our king. We, like Mephibosheth, are crippled, incapable of coming to God. Only our condition is much worse. Spiritually, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, Paul tells us in Ephesians. We are sinners against God and in our natural condition enslaved 
to the desires and affections that are opposed to God. By nature, we follow after evil and wickedness. And Paul says in Ephesians 2, by nature, we are children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Like Mephibosheth, we do not seek the king's kindness in our natural condition. But God, our king, he acts in kindness towards those who believe. And he does this by sending out his saving gospel message. Because remember, covenant grace is active. So he sends out his saving gospel message. And even more than that, God gives you saving faith to well in your hearts by giving you eyes to see and ears to hear the good news of the kingdom of God. God says, behold your God. And we, crippled in soul, cannot raise our eyes of faith. But by his covenant grace, the Holy Spirit of God gives us eyes to see and ears to hear. And he gives us faith to save. The strong and powerful and mighty God will save the weak and frail sinner who calls out in faith. And so friend, I plead with you this morning to call out to God in faith through Jesus Christ. Well, brothers and sisters, how frequently do you meditate on the active, effective, amazing grace of God in your life? How often do you meditate how amazing it is that you are a Christian? How amazing it is that you are a Christian? Brother and sister, long your imprisoned spirit lay Fast bound in sin and nature's night, God sent forth a quickening ray. You awoke and the dungeon flamed with light. Your chains fell off, your heart was free, and you rose, went forth, and followed thee. Brothers and sisters, God came for you, and God saved you. God saved you. Let there never be a time in your life when it seems reasonable or normal or even sensible that you are a Christian. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is amazing. It is astounding. And quite frankly, it's almost unbelievable that any of us are Christians. So praise God for his active, effective, and saving covenant grace. But did you also notice that the king's grace is not only effective in saving Mephibosheth in verse 6, It's also effective in restoring Mephibosheth to the fellowship in the king's court. Verse 7, King David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Always. King David took a defeated, crippled Mephibosheth the former heir to the throne, the last remaining person in the line of Saul and Jonathan, the former heir to the throne. And King David restored him to fellowship in the king's court. King David made him an heir again to the inheritance of his fathers. In essence, King David adopted Mephibosheth. He adopted Mephibosheth. This was not Mephibosheth by law, as if this was his due. He was not of the house of David, but this, friends, is an effective adopting covenant grace of the king. And so in the same way, brothers and sisters, when God effectually calls you to himself through the gospel, he takes a child of wrath and he adopts you and makes you an heir with Jesus Christ, the king. We see this in the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul, but you, Christian, have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with your spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with King Jesus Christ. So, beloved, this is your position in the kingdom of God. You are an heir with Christ by adoption. And like Mephibosheth, your fellowship with the king of glory is restored. And you have an inheritance from God your father that is imperishable. And you have new brothers and new sisters in the family of God, the church. 
as an aside, here we see the theological basis for the importance of church covenants, the importance of local church covenants. And you may think I've really gone off the reservation here, and that's fine. I'm willing to accept that. But we are adopted children of God. We're adopted children of God by covenant grace. And so we covenant together with other brothers and sisters in Christ in a local church. That's the church covenant. And so I want to encourage members of Central Baptist Church, of this local church, I want to encourage you to regularly read and consider your church covenant. Let the church covenant serve as a reminder of God's effective covenant grace to you, that he has brought you in to the household of God. And let it be a reminder of your covenant commitments to God to care for your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. God's covenant grace, we see here from King David, is effective to save and effective to restore. Well, how are we to respond? How are we to respond to as a recipient of such grace? Well, here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we see that the proper response to such grace is humility. It's humility. And this is the sixth observation from 2 Samuel 9. Covenant grace produces humility. Covenant grace produces humility. In verses 6 and 8, we read of Mephibosheth's response to King David. Verse 6, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to King David and fell on his face and paid homage. King David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. Verse 8, Mephibosheth paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Mephibosheth here shows us that the only acceptable response to such grace is humility. Mephibosheth recognizes his state before King David. And I wonder if you recognize your state before King Jesus this morning. Mephibosheth is a dead dog, unable to defend or provide for himself. Yet the king has shown kindness to him and lavished favor upon him. And the only right response in that situation is humility. I am your servant, says Mephibosheth. And so in light of all that we've considered this morning about the covenant grace of God in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, how much more than Mephibosheth should we respond to God in humility? King David was a man after God's own heart. He was the covenant king of Israel. But King David is but a shadow, a faint shadow at that of the covenant grace and kindness of our God. King David was highly exalted in his day. But listen to what King David has to say in Psalm 8. Psalm 8, King David says, When I look at your heavens, O God, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man, that you even care for him. What humility King David had before God. And what is man that God Almighty would be mindful of us? You are but dust, O man, and to the dust you will return. And so we pray, teach us to number our days, O Lord, for the years of our life are 70 or by reason of strength 80 We are like flowers in the fields. The flowers wither and the blossom falls and they're blown away. Well, brothers and sisters, let me remind you this morning that pride, pride is not a fruit of the Spirit. Pride is not a result of God's grace in your life. Pride is sin. And the old Puritan, Thomas Watson, Let me just take a moment and say that you should read the Puritans. Read the Puritans. The old Puritan Thomas Watson wrote, 
Christians are never more lovely to God than when they are lowly towards themselves. Christians are never more lovely in God's eyes when they are lowly to themselves. So I pray as we consider who God is and what he has done and why he has done it here in 2 Samuel 9, that, that I pray that we would be humbled. That we would be humbled. And particularly as you move forward in searching for a lead pastor, I pray that you would move forward in humility towards one another and towards God. Let us be like Mephibosheth, completely dependent on the covenant grace of King Jesus. Well, seventh and final observation from 2 Samuel chapter 9, second and final observation, covenant grace is future grace. Covenant grace is future grace. King David remembers his covenant with Jonathan. He actively, effectively shows kindness to Mephibosheth for Jonathan's sake. But let's read quickly verses 9 through 13 here in 2 Samuel 9 and see how covenant grace is future grace. The king, King David, called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house, I have given your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce, produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grand, grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. King David tells the servant Ziba that he and his sons shall serve Mephibosheth and his son Micah. And twice in these verses, did you note that Mephibosheth shall always eat, always eat at the king's table. There will never be a time as long as David is king that Mephibosheth will be cast out from the king's table. There will never be a time as long as David is king where Mephibosheth, crippled in both his feet, will be without servants and help. King David's covenant grace secured Mephibosheth's future. So we see here that covenant grace is future grace. And brothers and sisters, King Jesus, like King David, secures a place for his people at his table too. Have you considered that the Lord's Supper is a perpetual reminder of the new covenant grace that King Jesus has given to his people? The Lord's Supper is a regular reminder of the new covenant grace that God has given to his people through Jesus Christ. And so every time we gather together at the Lord's table to take the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death in the past, and we proclaim our sure and certain hope that our covenant-keeping King Jesus will hold us fast until that great day that we read of in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the so sound of mighty peals of thunder. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, church, your brothers and sisters in Christ, John hears this voice of a great multitude crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And so the angel said to me, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And on that day, brothers and sisters, we will dine with our covenant king forever, just like Mephibosheth. And we're reminded of that day every time we take the Lord's Supper together. 
But even more, even more than that. Did you notice in verse 13 that 2 Samuel 9 closes with a note that Mephibosheth is crippled in both his feet? At the end of this chapter, in the midst of all the grace that has been shown to him, all the restoration that has occurred in his life, Mephibosheth is crippled, is lame in both his feet. King David may have seen, may may have secured Mephibosheth a place at the king's table, but he wasn't able to fully save him from the effects of sin. King David died. Mephibosheth died. King David wasn't able to fully restore him, fully save him from the effects and ravages of sin. But King Jesus, well, King Jesus, not only will we dine with him in glory, along with all of our brothers and sisters from every tribe and nation and throughout all generations, but there will be a day for us, beloved, recorded in Revelation 21, when the covenant grace of King Jesus will be fully realized. It will be fully realized. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. God will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. The covenant grace of King Jesus secures a future for his people, beloved, where we will not only dine with him forever, but we will dwell with him forever in the new Jerusalem. We're not like Mephibosheth going to old Jerusalem. We are new covenant saints marching into Zion, into the new Jerusalem with our covenant king. And in that place, in that place, Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, no crippled feet, no cancer, no hurricanes, no pandemics anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on King David's throne, the Lord Jesus Christ himself says, Behold, behold, beloved, I am making all things new. The covenant grace of King Jesus says, Behold, beloved, I am making all things new. His covenant grace secures our future in the new heavens, the new earth and in the new Jerusalem. And so the bride of Christ says, Amen. Amen. Praise God for the covenant grace of King Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Oh God in heaven, how great our covenant privileges in King Jesus Without him, we stand far off, a stranger and outcast, but in him, we draw near, restored to our imperishable inheritance. Without him, we dare not lift up our guilty eyes, but in him, we gaze upon the loving kindness of our God. Without him, we hide our lips in trembling shame, but in him, we open our mouth in petition and praise. Without him, all is wrath and consuming fire, but in Jesus Christ, all is love and the security of our soul. Without him, all things external call for our condemnation, but in him, they minister to our comfort, and without him, we are left to our own wicked ways, but in him, we are invited to an everlasting feast with the family of God. Without him, darkness spreads its horrors before us in death, In him, an eternity of glory with you is our sure and certain hope. So praise be to you, our great God, for your covenant grace and for the unspeakable gift 
of King Jesus. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to one of our services. We would love to invite you, if you're ever in the Livingston area, to worship with us. We're located at 503 Northeast Avenue in Livingston, Texas. Here at Central Baptist, we are an intergenerational body of baptized believers with a blended style of praise who value expositional preaching, meaningful membership, consistent discipleship across all ages, and a gospel emphasis both locally and globally. If you'd like more information about Central, please visit our website at centrallivingston.com. Once again, thank you and have a blessed day.